models in this bitch, hundred models in this bitch. We gon' party like we won the fucking lotto in this bitch. Living reckless, yeah, we know your crew can't hang. We in the section, throwing up them hundreds like it's change. S I M B A, back at it, I'm down in the fifth. I bought the whole shit, making moves, I'm out of the trench. Got out of L A, West Coast, where I represent. It's me, it's me, Simba TV. Bang! What is good, YouTube fam? It's your boy SimbaCon back here again with another reaction video for you guys today. For today's reaction video, we got five horror movies based on true terrifying events. Now, man, you guys been loving, like, the top fives. You guys love, like, the list, the creepy, mysterious stuff, man. And I can't wait to jump up in it. If you guys are not yet subscribed, go ahead and hit that subscribe button down below. Become part of the notification. Gang, 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 gang. We're bringing new videos to you every single day. So without further ado, let's jump up in it. It's easy to sit back in the comfort of your own home or the cinema and watch a scary movie, knowing full well you can later tell yourself in bed that it was all just a film and didn't really happen. Hell no. Nah. Even if even if my mind goes to that, my mind is still like, nah, that can happen. And you know what? I hate watching movies when it says based on true stories. So I don't even like watching this top five list right now. <laughs> but what if you couldn't tell yourself that? Because the movie was in fact based on true terrifying events. Well, here are five horror movies where that is actually the case. Psycho and the Texas Chainsaw Massacre. Most will have heard of the infamous Ed Gein, also known as the Butcher of Plainfield. But if you haven't, then you should know that a few movies have been based on this man. The two most popular being Psycho and the Texas Chainsaw Massacre, which I will talk about together. It all started in Plainfield, Wisconsin, when for years, neighbors of the small community had suspected something was just not quite right about Ed and thought that strange things were going on at his property kids would mess around and see how close they could get to his creepy old farmhouse. Hell and no. he was labelled as the village oddball, but was always considered as a harmless man. That was until people started going missing, including the deputy sheriff's mother. Gein was the first suspect and his farm was searched and the true evil was revealed. Amongst his possessions were four noses, nine masks made from human skin, numerous decapitated heads, oh. lampshades made from skin, bowls made from skin and skulls, Lips being used as a pull on window blinds. Like, bro, how does that like? How does that intrigue you? Lips, bow, bowls of lips. Like, come on, bro. You out here wearing people's faces? Like, just wearing your own face, G. You already got it. You ain't gotta cut nobody up for it. Oh, that skin looks really pretty. Let me go ahead and take that one. Like, what the what what type of coonery? Eggins made from skin and a belt made from nipples. Gein was arrested and later admitted to two murders, including the deputy's mother, who was found gutted like an animal in Gein's shed. Wow. All the other body parts were the result of Gein raiding the nearby cemeteries and digging up bodies late at night. Police further searched his home and said it was filthy and there was rubbish all over the house, except for a few boarded up areas, one of which was his dead mother's room. After his mother died, Gein was devastated, and this is thought to be the main cause of his crimes. Despite the truly filthy house, his mother's old room was eerily kept in a pristine condition, just as she left it. So, when Alfred Hitchcock made Psycho, he based it on the very disturbing novel written by Robert Block, who lived within 35 miles of Gein's farm, and was aware of what had happened there. After Robert picked up the details of Gein's crimes, about Gein wearing clothing made from women's skin <gasps> so he could feel closer to his dead mother, Robert got the idea for Norman Bates and his obsession with his dead mother in the major hit movie. So, as well as Psycho, how was the Texas Chainsaw Massacre linked to Gein? Well, most of the movie sequels state, inspired by true events. And although no single character is based on Gein, the family in the films who abduct passers-by torture, then kill them, and use their body parts as decorations, is linked to Gein's crimes. And the Texas Chainsaw Massacre's skin mask is linked to Gein's mask made from female heads, and one of his victims, Mary Hogan, whose face was found in a paper bag in Ed's home. Wow! The horrors found in Ed Gein's home are up there as the most disturbing acts ever committed, and unfortunately, the small town of Wisconsin will forever be linked to those horrifying events that I'm sure will continue to inspire future horror movies, books, and documentaries. 
In 1977, Wes Craven released a movie called The Hills of Eyes. At the time, it enjoyed moderate success at the box office and has become a cult classic horror movie, which sparked the remake that most of us will be familiar with in 2006, followed by two more sequels. The original and the 2006 Hills of Eyes tells the story of a family on a road trip that becomes stranded in an atomic testing zone miles from anyone and anything. But soon the family find out that the area is in fact inhabited by a deformed cannibalistic family intent on making them their next prey. The film itself seems too far-fetched to be based on anything that did happen, but it is actually based on Alexander Sawney Bean and his family. Alexander was born a few miles from the city of Edinburgh, and later went on to become the head of a Scottish clan who lived with around 14 children and 32 grandchildren, all from incest. They all lived in a cave sometime during the 16th and 17th- Hold on, hold on, hold on. All of them made from incest? And they live in caves? And they just eating people? Bro. Bro, it's really sick. It's really, it's really wicked out here. That is wicked. In century and had a complete lack of communication with the outside world. During this period, hundreds of people traveling through the area near this cave would often go missing. And Sawney Bean and his family were responsible for this. Wow. They would ambush the unsuspecting victims, rob and murder them then take them back to their cave where they would cut them up and pickle their limbs for future consumption. All in all, the family is thought to have killed and eaten over a thousand men, women and children who wandered through their location. But it wasn't just the living they preyed on. It's reported that bodies from graveyards near the area were regularly dug up and the bodies were removed. No! Most were never found again, but one time three were apparently found hidden near the graveyard they had been taken from. It said the bodies were in an indescribable state and had been dumped by the family as they must have been unable to carry them back to the cave. The Bean's horrendous acts carried on for around 25 years until it finally came to an end when the husband of one of their victims managed to escape and alert the authorities. The word got all the way up to King James I himself and he led an army to the family's cave which was hidden during high tide and they discovered the true horror of 25 years worth of filthy living and cannibalism. They found body parts hung up like dried beef, pickled limbs, and masses of money and jewelry from their victims. Such outrageous crimes demanded an equally outrageous punishment. The men had their manhood cut off and flung into a fire. There were- What? Wait a minute, the two things just happened at once and I am thrown off! They- they chopped off they- 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 they manhood? The slong, the meat. And then threw it in a fire. And then you got this little fucking thing here. This too much. This is too much, y'all. Wives and children had their faces, hands and legs cut off and were left to bleed to death and then they were all burned in several fires. Yeah! The whole family were considered mutant monsters due to the amount of inbreeding, and this is shown in the movie The Hills of Eyes, along with a very similar storyline. So that is the story behind the movie. Now, although some argue the family's existence due to a lack of factual documents, there are many records in notable publications to suggest the family did in fact exist. The 2011 film, The Right, starring Anthony Hopkins, tells the story of the son of a funeral director who has a lack of faith, so is advised to travel to Italy to take an exorcism course in hopes of strengthening his faith in Christianity. Shit. Whilst there, he witnesses exorcisms being performed firsthand, but is still not convinced until something takes over one of his mentors and he is forced to perform an exorcism himself. If you think the film isn't scary enough, then the fact it's based on the Matt Baglio book, The Right, The Making of a Modern Day Exorcist, makes it even more terrifying. The book covers the believed real life events of trainee exorcist Father Gary Thomas and his experiences of working and training in Rome. He was initially skeptical when he was sent to Rome to learn to become an exorcist, but this initial skepticism was soon replaced with the reality of evil as he witnessed first-hand demonic possession. Wow. His mentor in Italy was Father Carmine, 
and during his apprenticeship, Father Thomas and he attended dozens of demonic battling rites. One particular incident he remembers was a lady called Lisa who was brought in by a worried family members that were concerned about her violent outbursts. Father Thomas said he felt a huge presence in the room as he started to pray. Lisa's face started to distort and she started speaking in a different language. She was hissing and spitting and taking on a strange look. Her eyes were rolling and as Father Thomas laid his crucifix on her, she let out an excruciating scream. He placed his scarf on her and yeah, no, that now that that's that's terrifying. That that is terrifying. Um, why did he tell me that? I didn't. I didn't. I could have lived my whole life not knowing that 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 was real. Um, now I'm even more scared to watch paranormal movies, um, Conjuring and stuff like that. Uh, yeah, Coach, that's a no for me, dog. That is a big no for me and she tried to slide away from it until the father said, that's enough for today. In the film, a similar sequence is played out by a woman who is possessed. She acts in a similar way, except she spits out metal nails. Father Thomas says he has never witnessed this himself, but it was told to him by another priest who apparently witnessed seven black nails be vomited up by a possessed woman. Father Thomas acted as a consultant on the film The Right and admitted that like most movies based on true events, some things have been dramatized, but he said the exorcisms in the film were very accurate. When it was released in 1991, The Silence of the Lambs This movie still creeps me out. It won a ton of awards, and for most people, it's one of their favorite horror movies of all time. Yeah. It's the story of an FBI student who was assigned to interview Hannibal Lecter, a cannibalistic serial killer and former psychiatrist who could help in the pursuit of a serial killer who skins his victims. While the film's three main characters are actually based on real people, two of which committed some of the world's most heinous crimes. And here are the people who Silence of the Lambs writer Thomas Harris used for his inspiration for the book, which the movie was made of. Thomas Harris was able to study the FBI's newly established behavior science unit, and the unit was exploring psychological profiling to pursue killers. It was here where Harris looked at the possibility of a female profiler and met Pat Kirby, Three years after he met her, Pat became the first female to join the behavior science unit, giving Harris the inspiration for Clara Starling of the same job role in Silence of the Lambs. Now he needed a killer who turned out to be Hannibal Lecter, an intelligent, polite, and very manipulative killer that was inspired by Ted Bundy, the murderer, sadistic rapist, and necrophile who killed at least 36 people in the 1970s. Finally, the Silence of the Lambs needed one more character, Buffalo Bill, the fictional psychopath who chose larger ladies as his victims. He would trap them in a pit in his cellar and starve them, making them rub oil into their skin in preparation for when he killed them, so he could use their supple skin to make dresses for himself. So it sounds weird, horrific man. and also sounds similar to Ed Gein's crimes. Well, this character was based off Ed Gein. As you know, Ed would use the skin from dead females to make items, such as socks and a vest from the skin of a woman's torso, which is thought he would wear around the house pretending to be a woman. The Shining. In 1983, horror author Stephen King checked into the Stanley Hotel in Colorado. He checked in for one night and him and his wife were the only guests staying there. As you can imagine, it's a huge place so being the only guest there is a scary thought. They were booked into room 217 and King and his wife had the run of the hotel. As he was wandering the empty halls, he allegedly got the feeling that they were not alone after all. He said he encountered some ghostly children wandering around and also witnessed a party in the ballroom attended by paranormal beings. Oh, hell King's no! feeling of seclusion while staying at the hotel, and how he believed silence could trick the mind, leading to paranoia, fear, and violence, was the inspiration behind the iconic horror novel The Shining, and subsequently the blockbuster movie. So let's look at the history of the Stanley Hotel. It was opened in 1909 by Flora and Freeland Oscar Stanley, and was and still is a secluded Grand Mountain Resort, but although the Stanleys have since long passed, it's said they never actually left. Mr. Stanley has been reported as standing behind employees at the reception desk, and Mrs. Stanley is often- Yeah, no, once again, that is a no for me, dog. That is a no for me. No ghost people standing behind me watching me do my job. Mm-mm. 
heard playing the piano in the hotel's music room. Just three years after the hotel opened, one of the housekeepers was apparently electrocuted during a lightning storm, and even though she wasn't killed, the room where it happened, number 217, has since been the subject of many paranormal incidents. Wow! It's thought that every room in the hotel has some sort of strange happenings though, from items moving on their own, lights turning on and off, and clothes being unpacked from suitcases. And on the fourth floor of the hotel, the sound of children running and giggling can be heard. The large ballroom where Stephen King saw the paranormal party is also the place where many workers and guests have heard loud music and talking, only to find no one there when they have gone to investigate. Now, I know a lot of you are not first on ghost hunters, but in 2006 they caught an interesting piece of footage. That's really the best believed paranormal footage caught at the Stanley Hotel, so I can't help but show it. One of their main investigators, Jason, was staying in the room 401, which is infamous for its activity, while a camera in the room caught a glass cracking and breaking by itself, and also a cabinet door opening and then closing. But what's interesting about it closing is that it latches shut, which is something the team and the hotel workers said is just not possible. Take a look. It's 5.30, I'm figuring I'm gonna stay asleep. Ooh. Get out! See, I'm still trying to wake up at this time, not really sure what's happened. Listen, I'm not sure what happened. This glass actually broke. The glass broke? Sure. Here's a piece. Wow. I heard the closet open. The closet, the closet door is open. I'm gonna put the camera on the table next to me. See Stop there. exploring. No. Get out! They don't want you there! Alright. You gonna go back to sleep? Oh man. Do you wanna see that again? Yeah. Oh my god. That's amazing. My hair is standing on end. <laughs> Did you hear the door latch? Yeah. yeah. Anytime you want to head upstairs and try to shut that door and make it latch, feel it free. It won't do it. It won't do yeah. it. I tried to slam I, that door as hard as I can because I'm here to try to solve solve what's going on. But you can you can turn the handle and put it in yeah. and let it loose, but well. you yeah. shut it. You could swing it shut as hard as you want. So that's that definitely caught my attention because I know that door doesn't latch. Pretty strange and that's why the hotel is said to be one of the most haunted places in America. But although the hotel was Stephen King's inspiration and his vision for The Shining, the actual film was not filmed at the Stanley Hotel. Much to the disappointment of King, most of it was filmed in a studio in London, with the exterior shots taken at Timberline Lodge in Oregon. But Stephen King did return to the hotel in the 1990s and filmed a mini-series that he felt was more visually true to the book. And if you do ever check into the Stanley, both the film and the miniseries can be viewed on a non-stop loop on the hotel's channel 42 if you are brave enough to watch it in your room. So that's five, while well, technically six horror movies that are based on true events and people. Now although some are only loosely based on true stories, it's a terrifying thought nonetheless. If you're wondering why a few movies didn't make it, such as The Exorcist, The Exorcism of Emily Rose and Annabelle, that's because I've already talked about them in previous videos. Thanks for watching. I hope Yo, that is crazy, bro. That is crazy. That makes me more creeped out to watch. The, like, uh, uh. come on, man. If you guys like this video, go ahead and hit that thumbs up button for me. Thank you guys for commenting, sharing, and subscribing. And I'll see you guys next time. Peace.